Living a public battle with cancer taught me, like, honestly, John, chill out. You need, you need, you need people to prop you up right now. You need their assistance. Take it. And boy, did I get it. Welcome to Believe in Progress, the American Association for Cancer Research Foundation podcast. Join us and be inspired by the incredible stories of those who have faced cancer with strength and resilience and the medical professionals who are working tirelessly to find new treatments and ultimately a cure. Believe in Progress isn't just about the science of cancer. It's about the human side of this disease. Together, we can make progress in the fight against cancer and bring hope to those who need it most. Welcome to the Believe in Progress podcast, where inspiring stories meet groundbreaking progress in the fight against cancer. I'm Mitch Stoller, your host and the Chief Philanthropic Officer at the AACR, the American Association for Cancer Research. Today, we have the pleasure of welcoming John Kincaid, a notable figure in the world of sports broadcasting and a remarkable three-time cancer survivor. John has captivated morning listeners on 97.5 The Fanatic since January 2021 and brings a wealth of experience from his time in both Philadelphia and Atlanta, including co-hosting The Big Podcast with Shaq. Beyond his professional accolades, John's journey through cancer and his unwavering passion for life, sports, and family promises to offer valuable insights and inspiration. Join us as we delve into John's story, exploring the interplay between resilience, sports, and the power of community in the face of adversity. John, welcome to Believe in Progress. It's such an honor and pleasure for us to have you here today. Mitch, it's great to see you. And uh, I was thinking of the last time we saw each other. Which was? Game oh, six. Yes. 76er Celtics last spring. And strangely enough, you knew that I had been diagnosed with cancer. Correct. Philadelphia sports fans that listen to my show did not. And the next morning I was announcing it to the city. And so I took my daughter to the game, yep. big Sixers fan, and we sat right next to you. That's correct. And being there that night, and I never told you this, but being there that night, it, you sort of um, took the edge off of me having to announce the next morning because of my association with the AACR, here's somebody sitting right next to me who I knew could understand what I was about to tell the whole city and what I was about to go through. And it meant a lot. And wow. it calmed me down. It took the edge off that I was able to do it the next day. I barely got through it, but I did get through it. Well, uh, I'm happy it took the edge off because we both were very um, disturbed with the outcome of the game. Well, that's remember. a whole nother issue. <laughs> we can blame Doc Rivers on another <laughs> podcast, but sorry, Doc. We definitely could do that, could we not? Yes. So, so John, three times cancer survivor, um, take us back to the first time you were diagnosed. Where were you and kind of what went through your mind at that time? I was in Atlanta, Georgia. I was a full-time in the business world, uh, as I'll just put it. It's easier to explain it that way. And I was a part-time radio host on the weekends. I had moved to Atlanta. Uh, I got, uh, thanks to Angelo Cataldi and Tony Bruno, they had called down to the sports radio station and they said, hire him to do the weekends, hire him. Mm -hmm. And on their advice, I didn't even do a test show. I didn't do anything. They just threw me on the air. And so I was doing sports radio on the weekends and I was in the business world during the week. I was literally the definition of burning candle at both ends. I tend to be an endless ball of energy, as you well know. <laughs> and uh, in my 20s, I was even more insufferable. <laughs> and it was just constant movement, constant excitement. And I started to feel tired. And I had no idea that till days where I would go to work and I would get done early morning meetings. I always tried to get stuff going in the morning and I was having to put my head down on my desk and literally like close the door and have the secretary at the time had a secretary that would field phone calls and everything. Could you, I, I'm, I'm, I'm doing something for the next half hour. I had to put my head down and take that. And naps. that's totally unusual for you. Absolutely right? unusual. And I'm a young man. I'm in my late twenties yeah. and, and I'm wondering what's going on. And by the time it was found out, uh, I was with stage three non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And I had ignored my body telling me, you're in distress, something's wrong. You're not, you're not yourself. You are, I would feel like every day I had a bad iPhone battery. Mm -hmm. iPhones weren't invented at that time in 1995, but I felt like I had that battery. Woke up in the morning and I would get in the shower and I'd be like, 
Okay, I feel great this morning. I'm in, and I was in fighting shape. Mm -hmm. I, I thought I thought I looked like a million bucks. Just ask me. And uh, I would, I, I said today's going to be a great day. And by ten thirty in the morning, I was wiped, and that wasn't me. And I kept ignoring it and didn't go to the doctors. So thankfully, the folks down at Emory St. Joe's and and uh, Northside had some doctors took great care of me. Uh, in fact, the two doctors who took care of me no longer are here on this earth. And I thank them both because they led me through my journey. I was okay. And then within a year and some, I had testicular cancer. And I was like, I had had experience with cancer because my dad died of cancer right. on my what, 16th birthday. What kind of cancer did he have? He died of pancreatic cancer okay. in 1981. Okay. So I have my 16th birthday. My birthday's uh, December 23rd. And my dad dies Christmas Eve mm. right after. And he died in the midst of a week, Mitch. Uh, went into Bryn Mawr Hospital to have his gallbladder removed. They thought it was his gallbladder. Hmm. They put him in for surgery. They opened him up and they closed him up. And at that time, when they opened you up right. and the air got to it, right. uh, they said he would be lucky to see Christmas. And he lasted till Christmas Eve. And so I had had experience as a young man and that looming thought of, am I going to get cancer? Yeah. Was in my head. But I was dumb and was so busy. I didn't have time to go to the doctor. Right. I didn't have time you, to- You put to, it off. Take, yes. I kept putting it off. Right. Because I think I also wanted to kick the can down the road going, okay, is there something wrong with me? And I never would have thought it was cancer. I didn't know what it felt like. Back to the non-Hodgkin's non sure. lymphoma. Do you yes. remember what, what, how, how they cured that? Was it, was it a, a drug called Rituxan? Well, they, Rituxan was absolutely okay. Involved. And I remember a red bag of, of like whatever was giving me my anti-nausea. Yeah. I used to call it my red bag. Right. So I don't know what that was. <laughs> I've, I've, I thankfully was managing to block a lot of that stuff out as I got right. older because my idea was put it behind me as much as possible mm -hmm. and to try to have it not, not be the boogeyman that was in the room. Right. I'm intimidated by very little, but cancer intimidates yeah. me. So the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, I, I think I might have told you this, but my brother, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, you did tell me so Rituxan saved his life. One of our trustees, a guy by the name of Dr. John Leonard, was one of the original founders of Rituxan. So what a small world, huh? And, well, and, you, you, you say the AACR and how it touches people. Yes. And we'll talk about how we got to get together yes. down the line. But I've, ha I've had weird stories like that. So like weird things like that. So testicular cancer, yes. right? Now, did they catch that early? And I was late. Yeah, yeah. They caught it early. Okay. But I was late for testicular cancer. Yes. Age-wise. Age-wise. I, mean. age -wise, yeah. I mm -hmm. was late. Yep. And so I was thinking, okay, what's going on here? Yep. And at that point, I, uh, and, and thankfully they caught it early. And at that point I said, okay, I'm not going to live. I made a, even though I was cured- in my head, I said, this happened to me two, in around a two and a half year period, I had two cancers. Yes. And I was convinced in my head that I was going to die. And no one could tell me differently. And uh, it was breaking my mom's heart. I bet. Because she was like, like and, I, and, I'm, and I'm not a quitter. But in my head, I was like, my body's defective. Something's wrong with me. And... What's going to be the next thing? And for years, I lived in fear of when is the next shoe going to drop? Right. But one of the blessings of it was it convinced me. I was in a, I, I, I was making for a young man, I was making around, at the time, around a quarter of a million dollars a year. And I was so convinced I was going to die. I had had many offers to go work in radio. And I told my mom, I said, I had just built a house before I was diagnosed with my second cancer. This is pre-radio days. Pre-radio days. Well, I was Even doing radio weekends. on the weekends. Okay. I was doing radio on the weekends, but I wasn't doing it as a full-time career. Every time I got offered to say, hey, would you want to do this full-time? I said, what are you going to pay me? Look at, look at, look, are you kidding me? Look at the money I'm making. No, right. I can't do that. I right. can't afford to. Right. And then I had built a brand new house down in Atlanta. I built this house as like a tribute to surviving cancer the first time. Mm -hmm. The week I was diagnosed was the week after I closed on my house. For the second time. For the second time. And I had a hospital bed. 
I remember the company's name was Hill Rom. And whenever I see Hill Rom, it freaks me out because I remember an empty living room. Mm -hmm. I delayed having my new furniture delivered and I had a hospital bed in the middle of my new house. Mm. And I remember that Hill Rom bed being in the middle of this empty brand new house. Just a, a, a visual you can't get out. Couldn't of get head. out of my head. Yeah. And uh, I told my mom, I said, if I survive this, I'm going to quit. And I'm, Go, gonna go do radio because I'm gonna die anyway. <laughs> and she was so bummed by that because she was just like, you're the most positive person that I've ever known and you're my child. And I was like, I'm not gonna live. <laughs> and I just was convinced in my head I yeah. wasn't gonna live. And I, 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 I put everything on hold. I said, well, I don't ever wanna get married. So this is before Yeah, Christina? this is before, this before my wife, yes. Mm -hmm. I said, I don't wanna ever get married. I don't want to ever be a dad because I've got this curse upon me and my family tree has a lot of cancer in it. In fact, the doctors at Penn did an entire cancer study on our family tree. Like a genetic Yes, sequencing. on our family mm -hmm. because of the amount of people in my family that had cancer. Your brother have cancer? No, he does not. My sister Thank does God. not. Uh, my mom did not till she died at 91. Mm -hmm. and, but my cousins had a marker and my uncles had a marker, and so I didn't have the marker. And when they told me I didn't have the marker, I went, hmm. Like, I started to think, okay, what is this? Could, like, wh what's going on here? But I told my mom, I said, if I survive, I am going to quit the business world, and I'll take whatever radio job I can get for whatever amount of money. Because I had money in the bank, and I yeah. figured, just do it. Yeah. I did it, and that ended up being one of the greatest blessings of my life that came out of, like, a horrible horrible time. Right. And so when that happened, like you started shopping yourself around for jobs in oh, the sure. radio business? Well, what happened was greatly enough, I went into remission. So, uh, my remission date that I was told was September 20th, 1980, uh, 1998. And I, so September 20th is the date. And I had made the promise to myself and in my head, again, I'm saying, I'm going to die. So why not chase my dream? And my dream as a kid was to be the next Howard Eskin. Really? And I grew up in this town in Philadelphia and Howard Eskin, for those who don't yeah. maybe know, was a legendary and still is legendary sportscaster in this town. Right. And I would tell my parents, I'm going to be the next Howard Eskin. And my dad would say to me, who was a mailman in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania and, and delivered the Philadelphia bulletin in the afternoons. My dad would say, do you know how many young men go to bed every night wanting to be Howard Eskin? And I guess he was just trying to make sure that I had a plan B. And my mom would say, I think you're going to be bigger than Howard Eskin. <laughs> Love it. And so there was just the balance of the parents. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and I know if my dad had lived, he would be calling me after every show to tell me what he disagreed with. A little with. critique. Oh, oh, he would have been like, yeah, <laughs> you were wrong on this. And with the Phillies, it was love this. It. But his love, of, But his love of sports, I think, helped to create my love of sports. And it was honestly the only thing we bonded over. My dad was a World War II vet, POW, graduate of Lower Marion High School, 20 years old, shot down over Germany. POW. As a, as a gunner on a B-17 bomber. Uh, so he was a man of, he's an old school dad. Of course. A World War II dad. Mm -hmm. And what we bonded over is like, I can always say is, my, my wife will say, well, what'd you two bond? I said, my, I was 16. And I was a bit of a pain in the backside. <laughs> so what we bonded over is sports and vacation. And the rest of the year, he was dad, and I was to listen to what he said to do. Right, <laughs> right, know, right. Type of thing. Take some so, lessons. Yeah, from take pop. some lessons. Yeah. So it was a, uh, it, it, it was different as far as, 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 you know, just, just getting started with this. And uh, it turned out to be one of the greatest blessings in my life, though. And I always say, cancer gave me a blessing. And cancer taught me lessons. Mm -hmm. And one thing it taught me and um, is, I believe, is to never doubt myself again. That the self-doubt, mm -hmm. self-doubt's the worst doubt. Because mm -hmm. as my mom said, and I'll use colorful words for Betty, she would say, the world is looking to kick your ass every day that you step outside the front door. Right. Why are you doing it for them? 
Because you're confident. Don't do that. You're a confident guy just by nature. I by think, nature, right? Cancer stole that from me for mm. a while. Yes, but I took it back. Yeah, I took it back, and I don't mean to get emotional, but it does. It was emotional to me. Yeah, it was. It was very much so. So let's fast forward. 18, 20 years, sure. right? And now all of a sudden you get another diagnosis, right? Yes. Well, what happens is, is uh, so I, I'm clear since 1998. Right. And, and feeling good. And, and I'm all. feeling good and everything. And by the way, too, is that the hockey team came to Atlanta. Right. And I had worked for the Philadelphia Flyers when I was in college and then after college. So hockey was my passion. I coached high school locally here at Westchester East in Downingtown when I was a young man. Uh, hockey? Ice hockey. Okay. So... Hockey was my passion. A hockey team was coming to Atlanta. I threw my hand in, the, hand in the ring and said, I want to work on the hockey broadcast team. And so that was the job that stole me away from the work world. So I did, the I, voice of? I worked, I worked, well, the voice was a guy named Scott Farrell. I know Scott. You know Scott Farrell. Yeah. Scotty Farrell. Real husky voice. Yeah, right? Scotty Farrell. <laughs> <laughs> he was our play-by-play -play guy. Right. And so I did pregame, postgame, between periods on the radio and I did pregame show television, postgame show television. I evolved into, they made it like a hybrid role. And uh, so that's where I started in the broadcasting career. And I would do talk radio on the weekends. And then after a year, I switched to doing a talk show that ended up lasting almost 21 years. By the way, did you know you had the voice? I mean, did you know? I don't have the voice. Oh, I think you do. See, that's weird is that I do not. I listen to you. And many people in radio will tell you that uh, when they listen to themselves, they hate hearing their voice. Right. I love like uh, listening to other hosts and I'll go, God, I wish I had his voice. I wish I had their voice. I think it's more, I look at it as uh, if I've managed to find any level of success, it's because of what I say, not how I say it. Because I still have to overcome. Delco can come out at any time. And I had, when I started working at the network level to where I was broadcasting to the whole country, I had a boss say to me at one time, you did not have a glass of water. John, tell, tell our listeners Del what that means, Delco. Well, De oh, yeah, coming, I'm there. yeah, Delco yeah. Is, a, is a suburb of Philadelphia. Yeah. But if you didn't realize it, Delco is the 51st state. <laughs> because people from the suburbs of Philly that are from Delco, right. we believe in a level of provinciality to our community that exists almost nowhere else in the United States. We're more important than Chester County, where I now live. We're more important than Montgomery County. Right. We're more important. I'm, I'm looking at Independence Mall. Right. And honestly, a hoagie shop in Springfield is a more historic spot to people <laughs> from Delco than beautiful Independence right. Mall that I'm looking at. It. Did Kate Winslet get it right when I she, th that she did that show? It's, yes. If everybody saw uh, Mayor of Easttown, yes. Kate Winslet did an amazing job. Now, nobody does it better than Tina Fey because she's from Delco. Right. So, and when Tina Fey and Jimmy Fallon do the Delco girls, have done the Delco girls on Saturday Night Live. Yep. It's enough to make me pee my pants. Because <laughs> it is, it's so, because Jimmy Fallon, it's so perfectly done. Yes. That it's just, oh, I got a hoagie at the Wawa. And right. it's, you know, and it's, but people from this suburb really do believe we are the 51st state. We have Delco gear. We have Delco hats. We have Delco hashtags. Right. It's on my my ex bio. I mean, being from Delco is a badge of honor because it creates community. Yeah. And I know that's one of the things that the AACR is so big about. Oh yeah. Is that one thing I've always felt in my life is that I search community because of where I came from. I search for community. I search for. I love being home here in my fan base where I grew up. Where I'm amongst my fan base. That's what brought you back here, It right? brought me back. Yeah. Yeah, COVID, COVID and everything like that. And they told me in Atlanta after 21 years, well, we're going to have to renegotiate that contract. And, and we can't pay you what we've been paying you. And they had all these COVID losses and everything. And mm. I said, well, let me see if someone else is willing to pay me mm -hmm. what I can be paid. And sure enough, they did. And I had a chance to come home. Yeah. And to come home to Philly in January of 21 during the midst of COVID yes. was such a blessing. And what the only sad thing was is that when I was negotiating to come home, my mom was dying. Mm -hmm. and, and she was here. And she was here. Yeah. And born, raised, died, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And uh, my mom died at 91. But a we, she knew before she died, before she sort of lost her lucidness the last week, uh, she knew that I was coming home. She just didn't know where I was going to land. And 
my mom, one of the last things she said to me, Mitch, is um, it was like, well, we're, I'm looking at this and I'm looking at this. And she said, well, you always make good decisions. She said, you always, always make good decisions. Hmm. And so that was enough for me that I, she, she always instilled confidence in me. Mm -hmm. And that's why I was so disappointed in myself when cancer took my confidence from me. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that for sure. a minute about, so I think hope plays a lot into your, sure. what, since I've met you, you're a very hopeful, Absolutely. inspirational kind of guy. How, how did you get from the self doubt to bringing hope into the equation? Time, uh, chasing my dream in life to do something that I loved as a career, not something that I just loved the money that was part of the career. Leaving the business world, I said, oh, how can I turn away from that money? Right. And God bless it, chasing my dream, the money's all come back. Right. The money's all come back. So it's, I, I truly believe, and I do speaking engagements now where I will talk to business communities and tell them the story of, now I can tell them the story of three-time cancer survivor. Right. So I have to raise my fee. Right. I haven't ta <laughs> talked about it. I think I got to raise my fee because the three-time cancer survivor is a story that in and of itself, but in all seriousness, it's the idea okay. of, I think with time, confidence came. But leaving a very successful career, starting a new one in my 30s, and then finding success in that, uh, like Austin Powers, it gave me my mojo back. <laughs> right. And I got my mojo back. Yes. And I got that confidence back that until 2023 <laughs> didn't get dinged again. But I swore when the cancer came the third time, this is going to be a different fight because I had other people to fight for and I had such amazing support and AACR was part of that. Can we talk about uh, sure. the support of your family? So oh Christina and, and Olivia and I, I've had the pleasure to, yes. to sit next to Olivia at, at the ball game. And what a, I, I think I told you the next day, what a wonderful young lady and uh, really knows her basketball. She does, which she I was, loves basketball. I was really into that. And, uh, but, but you could just see how much she was trying to bring uh, comfort to you that night because yes. she knew what you were getting ready to do the next day. And I was so impressed with her. And so you should be very proud of her. I'm sure you are. But I tell am. me about how important family is to the cancer, specifically the cancer journey, I guess, in dealing with all that. Well, I can tell you that uh, I say to, oh gosh, okay, stay composed. Um, I wrote, after what went on last year, I, 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 and coming through it, my third cancer, the, the Friday before Thanksgiving, which I thought was sort of uh, symbolic. You know, Thanksgiving. Very much so. What do I do on Thanksgiving? I eat turkey and I gorge myself. This year, Thanksgiving was about real thanks. And I'd never felt that before. You knew the words, but I never felt, and I thought it was very ironic that the day they're telling me, you can ring that bell if you want, Right, was right before Thanksgiving. But um, my mom had always told me that I had a guardian angel because I tended to be a bit of a, a troublemaker mm -hmm. when I was younger. Mm -hmm. I was a hard kid to wrangle in, mm -hmm. as the nuns at St. Annie's would tell you <laughs> where I went to school. Uh, but a little bit of Ferris Bueller in high school. But my mom always told me, you have a guardian angel. Because somehow you always come through. <laughs> something always, something, there's somebody propping you up because right. you always manage to come on unscathed. Yep. And so I, I wrote my wife a little book this year at uh, Christmas. Um, and it was uh, Johnny Has a Guardian Angel. And I thought of the stories when my mom would throw that at me, like, you know, you have a guardian angel because somebody's getting you through all this unscathed. Right. And I said, I think I realized this past year that my guardian angel was my wife. Because every time I needed to be propped up last year, there was nobody who had more of the brunt of doing it than my wife. And, and there were plenty of times that you needed to be I propped did, up. I did. Yeah. I didn't let on. I didn't let on. Uh, because the other times that I had cancer, Mitch, I wasn't doing my radio show. Right. And I wasn't doing it publicly. Right. No, when, 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 a, when a gentleman from an insurance company here in Philadelphia or maybe an attorney, someone who works in an attorney's office, or a plumber, or an electrician. They go through their cancer battle, and they just got to battle it. Right. And they got to battle it. They don't have, like, community rallying around them right. to support them. 
And I so admire it when I see that. But they also don't have everybody looking at them. Right. And counting on them to how are you feeling? How are you? If I, if I answer, if I had a buck for everybody, so right. how you doing? Right. How are you feeling? For last year, I'd be, I'd be retired already, you know, because <laughs> it was what was happening. But it was out of concern. But everywhere I would be, it was public. And then when my, when I started to have issues with, when my hair got to a certain length, it was, I would rub it off on the, it would come off on the pillow it would come yeah. off. And I was just like, okay, I got to really shave it down tight. And then people saw me and I looked differently. Yeah. And then, as I said, I'm one of the only people who every single time I've had cancer, I put on weight. Yep. That's crazy. I don't know. How, I, I, and, and seriously, it was 27 pounds <laughs> put on doing uh, oxypalatin and 5-FU. And uh, they named that appropriately, by the way, 5-FU. <laughs> I got five of them for you. And it is that double chemo uh, was rancid on your body. Terrible. But for some reason, I didn't get sick. I felt like crap, but I didn't get sick. And I just, I, I, I thankfully, but I think keeping weight on me helped. Yeah. And every morning from 6 to 10 when you were on 97.5 The yes. Fanatic, you brought the energy. Sure. You, 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 I mustered I mean, it up. You did it. I, I mean, bluffed. And, and I there watch, were a few days. I watch and listen to the show. Um, and so, and I, I wouldn't bullshit around. I mean, I would, I would say if, I, if, I, if you were tired or looked sure. tired, but you didn't. I mean, you really went at it. And yes, the people around you, that, that radio family, I think, were very supportive of you as the well. The whole community yeah. pl propped me up. Pretty awesome. I mean, all the sports teams, uh, athletes in town reaching out, fellow media members, uh, the AACR yeah. supporting me. Uh, everybody just, it was, it was incredible. Yeah, John, so for our listeners out there, people that are currently battling cancer or family members who are battling cancer, you know, talk about, I mean, what would be your advice for people like to kind of get over that self-doubt that you had to deal with and then turn that into some real hope? I think one of the things that you need to do is realize that uh, there are times in life where you need to ask for help. There are times in life when it does not show, and this is a hard one for me, it does not show weakness to ask for some assistance, to ask somebody to be your ear for the moment, to have somebody that you can confide in and share a story. And that's not me. I am very much, uh, I'm bulletproof. I got this. Let me, let me handle it. And it's a foolish way to live especially when you have kind and generous people who want to help prop you up. Yeah, you, it's hard to not look at it as weakness. And that's what I tried to change this time around, to not look at it as that the people who are reaching out to you and the people that are trying to prop you up, living a public battle with cancer taught me, uh, like, honestly, John, chill out. You need, you, need, you need people to prop you up right now. You need their assistance. Take it. And boy, did I get it. I, I, I got, and I wouldn't have gotten through as, as easily as I did. And I do say as easily as I did, because it was, it was 12 weeks of 12 treatments over 24 weeks, every other week. And it would start on Wednesday afternoon after my show. Uh, and that would be my, my steroids, my anti-nausea, and then my oxypalatin, mm -hmm. which is still haunting me today. Uh, the side effects from that hopefully is going to go away. And then before I would leave, they'd hook me to my port and I would have the mobile pump right. that would pump me with the 5-FU poison through Friday at lunchtime yep. when I would get disconnected. And it, it, it got to be murder as it went along. By treatment eight, I, I was cruising till like seven. Right. And then around treatment eight. It was getting to you. Oh, yeah. yeah. And, by, and by, I got to the last four. I had told my wife under no circumstances, and, and I wrote it down, under no circumstances am I to say I need a break. Because my great doctors, and all of them, from Jack Colazzo, who found my cancer, to Henry Schoon Young, who took away my cancer, to the Sprandios, and Dr. Sprandio, John Sprandio Jr. is spectacular, who helped me come through this with my treatments. I had sworn, he goes, if you don't take a break, if you can get through this, the success rate is amazing. Okay. And I told my wife, under no circumstances am I quitting under, uh, or taking a break. You were also promoting this publicly too. Remember oh, yes. Social media? Oh, yes. Um, was it 
uh, I forgot blocks or what. Uh, my, I, what I did is my daughter and I, my daughter needed something as much as I did to just realize we're going to get through this. Yes. She is thankfully beautiful and smart like her mother, but she is very much her father's child. And I need goals and objectives to, and check boxes and see progress. So we went to, my wife brought home 12, a, bo- a thing of 12, like plain blocks. Right. And my daughter and I painted them and then numbered them. Right. And I created a tower of 12. Right. And every time I had a treatment day, from the very beginning, I had a block tower designed as 12. And then the next time I would have a treatment, it would be a block tower of 11 block tower. It was great. And people saw it. Yep. People responded to it. Uh, and people built me up along the way. Like, look, yeah. you're halfway home. Yeah. You're everything. And did by, it help you? Did this? It, it did. It, it did. It, it's um, social media doesn't tend to be the warmest, fuzziest place right. at times. Uh, but boy, did it help. Like it really did. And it was something whereby, uh, like when I decided to, when I was diagnosed with cancer, I decided to do a, a public message. So that way I could say it and not have to say it 50 times. Right. And uh, so there are some benefits to it with social media. But with my daughter and I, with our blocks, and then every time it'd be throwing one away. And when I threw that last one away, I broke down. I'm sure you did. It was just like, I can't, I can't believe. How about Liv? Did what she we break just down too? No. No? She's tough as nails. Yeah. Or she may have broken down with her mom. Okay. She may have broken down... But that was helpful for your family as well. I think it was. Yeah. I think it was. I don't know how they they were spectacular. Mm-hmm. And I'm a blessed man because they were spectacular. And by the way, too, when I say family, I have a large, large extended family here in Philadelphia. Mm-hmm. And they were fantastic and took care of me. And my friends, friends that in the last few years that I've gotten much closer to again that I had moved away from. But I'd stay in touch with them. I'd see them. I would see them maybe once or twice a year. Mm-hmm. And now to be able to have them be a few miles away. One of my best friends growing up, Joe, um, is now was a, was literally like three miles away. Um, another friend of mine, Pam, who was from here, and her and her family is friends with. Like it was a, a life a lifetime of friendships was reopened to me when I returned home. Little did I know how much I would be leaning on them in just a couple years. That's fantastic. So. Three and a half years ago, it was COVID, right? Sure. And I think it was December, sometime in mid-December, you would you accepted the job. I right. don't think you started until January. I didn't start right? January 4th. And um, our good friends, Dina and Jamie, uh, scheduled a call. And it they was did. the first opportunity for me to meet John Kincaid. And um, and I just I knew immediately, just, just listening to the man talk, and we were just having a conversation, um, what a great ambassador John would be for the American Association for Cancer Research for AACR. And we decided then to become the charity partner of the John Kincaid Show. And three and a half years later, going on four years, we proudly still are. So John, talk, talk, talk to our audience about the 97.5 um, AACR Kincaid relationship. Well, one of the things I did was uh, I did my homework on you and your organization. I'm sure he beforehand. <laughs> beforehand. And one of the things that I always look for with a charity is a stewardship of funds. And I looked at the AACR and I looked at the fine work that is done. And I look at the efficient use of funds. Because to me, there and I know I'm not throwing rocks, but there are charities out there where a lot of money is spent on uh, crystal chandeliers and gorgeous offices. Not that your office isn't beautiful, Mitch, with the uh, final four, uh, you know, pop a shot on the back of your door there. Uh, but I think they spend the money sometimes for show. Mm-hmm. The AACR is not about show. The AACR is about results. And what I also loved was the fact that it's about young minds. It's about innovation it's about what's coming, not necessarily what already has happened. And to me, that inspires me. I teach college now one, one course a year. I, I, you know, I don't call myself a professor. I just tell them, call me John. But I love the shaping of young minds, the interaction with young people. Me too. And well, it's obvious. That's why you're here. Mm-hmm. Because the AACR is about, honestly, I think very much so, what cancer is going to be like five, 10, 15 years from now, and hopefully obliterated down the line. 
And I love that mission. I love a mission that's about not spackling the wall. It's figuring out how to fix the problem that's behind the wall right. and to be able to make the big move. So uh, let me tell the audience, because uh, I just spoke to John this morning about this. We, uh, we approached John about the John K developing the John Kincaid Scholars. And uh, John and, and the station started raising pretty significant money for this. And our annual meeting is coming up April 4th through the 10th in San Diego. And Did you pick San Diego, by the way? Well, it's— Because if you did, you're a really bright executive. I mean, I, I, I will did, say. I did not. I'll let <laughs> Dr. Foti gets all the credit. Thank you, Dr. Um, Foti. I'm sure that's we, a great trip. You know, we move the annual meeting around uh, every sure. year. Um, and to be quite honest with you, San Diego is a phenomenal place to go, but we're going to have about 23,000 people will be at this meeting, it's which incredible. is the largest cancer meeting in the world. And uh, But really, what's really more important to me and to you is that 22 young people are having their travel paid for because of the John Kincaid Scholars Program. And um, I, I thought when we first started this, uh, like this beginning of the year, uh, to the fact that we can get 22 young minds to be able to go and maybe life-changing experiences for these young people, you should be very, very proud. And, and so should our, our good friends at 97.5 and the community at large. I'm proud of the this. people who donated. Yes, absolutely. I'm proud of the sponsors, you know, sponsors that got behind it, listeners that got behind it, and some of the events that we had during the year to raise money for it. Yes. I'm proud of them. Yes. And and uh, I don't know that... Uh, I don't, know, I don't know what those, those 22 young scholars, they're going to make a difference in one way or another. No doubt. And, and to think that some, someday, and I really do believe it, that someday, uh, maybe, maybe cancer is going to become like something where people, I always have this in my head, that there will one day be a conversation where people say, do you believe that people used to die by the tens of thousands of cancer when they'll figure out a way to be able to handle it and be able to do that. And with the AACR's mission, they will, it, it gets a little closer all the time. With your optimism and with the know-how we know that's out there, they will make that happen. And to be able to give young people the opportunity to attend a meeting like this sure. and get exposure to some of the smartest people and in the world. And meet people. It, Network. Networking's big time. Very, very important now, at these meetings. putting scholars associated in any sentence with my name, though, <laughs> there are going to be teachers from Temple University and otherwise that may want to check the fine print on that one. Because uh, John Kincaid and scholar was never used in the same sentence. John, tell us a little bit about what you do at Temple, what, what, the, what the class is. I teach talk radio mm -hmm. in Klein College of Media and Communications. And uh, my buddy, Dean David Boardman, uh, a few years ago, I expressed an interest in teaching when I came home. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, let's let's put a class together and get through it. And uh, uh, I had my first class last year. And then my second class is going on this year. Mm -hmm. And if I can tell a not terrible story, I'm a very unorthodox teacher. And so I like to do group activities where I said, look, in the media, you need to work as a group. You need to work with your producer. You need to wear this. So a few of the projects during the class, you got to work all together. Well, my final exam, which my wife did not like when I, when I told her what it was going to be, my students were all told, take all the information you've learned this semester, just bring it with you. You're going to have a group activity. Show up. Well, when they showed up on April the 26th, I believe it was, April 26th or 27th for the last class, I walked in and I was dressed up and I said, thank you everybody for attending tonight. You're all here for the memorial service of John Kincaid which a week later seemed really stupid. <laughs> but at the time, I didn't know. And my students were there attending my memorial service, and I was reading from my will to tell them, well, his last wish was that all of you students would all be able to tell something that you learned this semester about the broadcasting industry and a lesson you learn and take something away. So you're all going to come up and take a number out of the box. <laughs> and the only rule is, None of you can repeat what the other person said. So they went through it and it was, and I said, and if you'd like to say a fine word about your professor in passing, well, the next week to the day they found my cancer hmm. and my wife almost took me out. <laughs> she bad. almost, she hated the idea when I did it, 
I didn't think. Right. I wasn't feeling right, mm. but they had told me that because of this Apple Watch, yeah. they had told me they thought I had AFib. Mm. And I said, well, AFib would be maybe why I'm not feeling well. Right. They didn't realize I was bleeding out. Mm. And I didn't realize how bad it was. Yeah. And again, much like the error I made the first two times, I was like, yeah, I don't feel right, right. but I'm okay. But you didn't go to the doctor right away. And thankfully, Dr. Jack Colazzo found my, uh, found my cancer. And then thank God they took care of me. And, but my wife could have killed me because that was my final exam. That will not be my final exam this year, Mitch. Just so <laughs> my students know I'm letting that cat out of the bag. I will come up with a different final exam because I never would have guessed it. Just the strangeness of it. And all my kids, when they found out the news the next week, were like horrified. Right, I'm sure. As I was. Yeah. You know, a little bit. But it was great. Yeah. John, um, any last thoughts for our audience uh, to, about AACR, about cancer research in general? I, I think you still close out the show, Cancer Research every day. Saves Lives. Cancer which, Research Saves Lives. Which I love. Every, every day I try to tell people that it's not always <clears throat> the a, a, a wall, a building, a beautiful structure like we've got here is not all done by the giant cornerstones is not all done by the, the large grant or the, the, that the $50, $25, $100 bricks matter. And I think that sometimes people feel, well, I, I don't have enough to offer. I, I, it, like, I only have 20 bucks. I only have, and, and I'll say to people, especially when we'll do some of our fundraising days, uh, if, if you didn't eat out, if you didn't eat, if you brown bagged it for a week, right. you could save 20, 30 bucks right. that you could donate. And God knows people do it. Many $9.75 gifts. Yes, and all, I like that. It's like, look, whatever it is, because every brick matters. Yes. And the power is the power of community and the power of so many people coming together. And, and, and look, if a bunch of small donations come in, they can make a large, a, a large difference. And if, and if we know, if we have 22 scholars that are going to be rubbing elbows with the greatest minds in cancer research, Something's got to come of that. Absolutely. That's seeding, that's seeding the backyard. That's fertilizing the garden. No doubt about that. John, um, uh, it's such a pleasure to have you here and, and, and just to be with you. And I just know when that, uh, when you rang the bell, the, you know, the last time when uh, I felt so good inside and, and my, my wife and my daughters also kind of knew your story and know a little bit about you. And, um, you're such a, a positive guy and you're such an ambassador for the city of Philadelphia and for AACR. Uh, we're so proud to have a relationship with you and, um, let, let's keep it going. And oh, let's keep let, it going. Let's get another 22 next year or 44 next year. Oh, no, no, year no, 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 no. Yeah, let, let's, no let, let, 22 should be the floor now. There you go. Now we go, now we build. And, and by the way, um, uh, how'd the show go today? Yes. My, so uh, our, our, new, our new iteration is we've shuffled some things around. Yep. Kincaid and Salchunas premiered this morning. Right. And a Andrew Salchunas, another Temple product. Yes. So a lot, we've lot got a lot of energy, a lot of energy there. A lot of fun. <laughs> and, uh, and two, a great new dynamic. Whenever you get to play with someone different and you just change things up, yeah. it just changes the energy of everything because it's a, just a different, a different conversation. Because much like uh, if you discuss with your, your best friend or your wife or something like that, you obviously, you know in a conversation where they're going to go. You know their tendencies. Yes. When you're working with somebody different, it's, it's a change up. Yes. So it's very exciting and we're very much looking forward to it. And we're looking forward to a great year with the AACR and including a, a little run- well, I'm going to say jog, walk, run down Broad Street. Right. That we'll talk about later in the year. That's the, you're talking about the 10 miler? Coming yes. Up? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, and we're going to, and uh, so I'm really looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, just doing, advancing it because I do believe that the AACR, because benefits of the AACR benefited me, I guarantee you this time around, because my, my, my cancer, my, uh, you know, treatment with Oxy and 5-FU has one of the highest success rates of any chemo treatment. Mm -hmm. And that was not existing 10 years ago. That wasn't existing. Right. So Re that's, science, that's, research. that's the science. That's the research. So anybody that can, can do anything on a daily basis and it can be small fundraisers, big, big, big gestures, whatever it is, it's all appreciated. And from a three time cancer survivor, it's greatly appreciated. So John, we appreciate you. We, we, 
appreciate you being a great ambassador for for our organization and and for just funding cancer science. Thank you. Uh, very very important. And uh, we'll all listen from six to ten in the morning. Ninety seven five the fanatic. And if anyone's anywhere in the country, they can get the fanatic app anywhere or YouTube. Anywhere. Look at the YouTube channel and they can watch it. There you they go. They can see this hair that's come back with a vengeance. John, uh, again, appreciate your time today. Thanks, Thank Mitch. you very much, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll continue our wonderful relationship. I'll see you soon. Okay, thanks, man. As we wrap up this incredibly inspiring episode of the Believe in Progress podcast, I'd like to extend a heartfelt thank you to John Kincaid for sharing his journey with us. John's resilience in the face of cancer, combined with his successful career and love for sports, reminds us all of the strength found in passion, perseverance, and community support. His story is a testament to the power of facing life's toughest challenges with determination and hope. To our listeners, thank you for joining us and being part of this important conversation. Your engagement helps us continue to spotlight those making a difference in the fight against cancer and beyond. For more information about John's work and to keep up with his journey, please check our show notes. Remember, no matter what challenges you may face, there's a community ready to support you and stories like John's to inspire you. Stay tuned for more episodes and celebrate progress, innovation, and the human spirit in overcoming obstacles. Thank you for listening to the Believe in Progress podcast. Until next time, keep believing in the power of progress and the difference we can make together. Once again, thank you to our listeners, supporters, and donors. And remember, your support drives the progress against cancer. Please consider subscribing to our podcast, sharing this episode with a friend, and heading over to our website, aacr.org to consider making a donation. When you donate to the American Association for Cancer Research, your investment in life-saving research propels the important work of the more than 58,000 members of the AACR in driving progress against cancer. You can support the life-saving cancer research with any donation you make today. Thank you so much for listening to Believe in Progress, the AACR Foundation podcast. This podcast is produced by CollegeCast, LLC. Please visit www.collegecastpodcast.com for more information. And just like what John Kincaid says when he closes his show, cancer research saves lives. Mm -hmm.